Okay, so this really, all of this is our heavy topics, aren't they? Yeah. So I'm in no eyes an expert on this, and I'm still learning um, from others on all of this. Okay, okay. so we're going to do a quiz. And uh, so before we do the quiz, are there any questions regarding this morning or comments, questions or comments? Because I want to learn from you as well. Do you have any questions regarding the topic for this morning? I didn't realize. <clears throat> well, let's start with a word of prayer. I'm sorry. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord in heaven, we ask for your blessing that your spirit will guide us into uh, truth and Lord, we by no means have exhausted it, but we do pray, Lord, that you will flood our minds with what is truth and what is right, and uh, all through your word, of course. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> okay, Judith, I'm sorry. Um, in Leviticus 11, I mean 16, I didn't realize that God had By a fit man. <laughs> right. Right. What verse is that? It says. No, it's chapter sixteen, but it's not verse sixteen. I have a feeling it's probably later than sixteen. Um, the verse 16, I mean. Um, oh, let's... Uh, 21. 21. Yeah. So it says, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins. I'm glad you pointed this out because there's something interesting in this verse. All uh, their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, the live one, and shall send it away into the wilderness <clears throat> by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear, and this, I didn't even mention this morning, verse 22. Verse 22. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and, sh and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. So this is interesting because... <clears throat> There's two goats that bear iniquities. There's the one for the Lord, and there's and there's this one. Um, but they they bear iniquities in a different sense. One of them bears iniquities and dies for it. Now we know in the sanctuary system, if an animal dies bearing the iniquities, it's because it has a substitutionary aspect to it. It's a substitute for the human because the wages of sin is what death. If God were to deal with us as our sins really deserve, the, the planet wouldn't be populated. <laughs> the, the, the planet wouldn't be populated. There would be no people. That's why David says in Psalm 103, he says he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. And that holds true with this whole system. He is not treating us as we really deserve. So God put in place this way where we can continue living and our sins are symbolically transferred to an animal as a sacrifice, as a substitute for what I really deserve. I really deserve the death, not the poor little lamb. The lamb's innocent. Lambs don't sin. And uh, so in that sense, bearing my iniquity, my sins, is that he's taking my place as the guilty one of my sin and therefore I get away scot-free because of that substitute. Well, the scapegoat, it, it's, the Bible clearly says it bears the sins of all of the iniquities of Israel, but it's not substituting in the sense of shedding its blood for forgiveness, for continual life. It's not doing that. It's just bearing all of the guilt, period. And so this is the part that I didn't, and I was reviewing the lesson, and the lesson doesn't go over this too much. I think it's tomorrow's lesson. But we interpret that as um, representing the devil. 
in the sense that the devil is ultimately responsible for sin, ultimately, because it all started with him. And so that's how we feel, that's what it represents. So, any other question or comment? And, and by the way, the devil bearing sins, um, the devil is never destroyed during a thousand year period of judgment. And we'll go over this later, but Revelation chapter 20 um, says that the saints of God, the saved, will be with Jesus for a thousand years. And it says, and they will judge the nations. That's what it says. Revelation 20 says they will judge the nations. So, in fact, let's read it. Go to Revelation chapter 20. I'll tell you what page it is. Well, you know where Revelation is. So Revelation 20, and I'm on page 1188. <clears throat> page 1188. And look at verse 4. I wouldn't say nation. It says judge, but um, I might have been thinking of another verse with that wording, judging the nations. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Now that's a strange verse because unless you have a different scenario of how all of these things are played out. But the interesting thing is in Revelation 19, you have Christ coming back with the white horse and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And coupled with Passages like 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, Matthew 25, where it talks about the second coming of Christ. The saints are ascended to the sky where Jesus is waiting when he comes back, and they will be forever with the Lord. Well, here in Revelation 19, the beast and the false prophet, the false prophet is the beast that rises out of the, the earth. Revelation 13. So the false prophet is synonymous with the earth beast. Along with the sea beast, they're thrown in the, fi the, the um, lake of fire. Revelation 19 says this. It also repeats in Revelation 20. So the scenario that we are teaching in the seminar is that the saints are with Christ for a thousand years in heaven. In heaven. Why? Because on earth, on earth, it says here, well, in Revelation 19 again, earth has been decimated by the second coming of Christ. Even before the second coming of Christ, there's earthquakes that split the great city in, in three, and you know, a third of the marine animals die. The sun is scorched. People, including hail weighing 75 pounds. I mean, just imagine the destruction of planet Earth from that hail alone. Uh, it's, it's a terrible place. And so this thousand years are not a millennium of peace on earth. Rather, it takes place in heaven. Now, these saints are judging in heaven. That's what, that's what verse 4 says. Meanwhile, it says here on planet earth, verse 1, chapter 20 of Revelation. We're in Revelation 20, verse 1. I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit. The other thing about this chapter, we going to read the whole thing, is that people are dead because uh, when Christ comes back, he will resurrect the dead in Christ, and along with the living, they'll go back with them in heaven, and everybody else is dead. In fact, on the day that that happens, people are going to cry to the rocks and mountains, fall on us! <clears throat> and um, they are slain. So that's sort of a, that's a precursor to the final great white throne judgment after the thousand years. But here's what I'm getting to. The saints are judging for a thousand years in heaven. Why would it say judge? I mean, why not just say, and the saints are singing with their harps. <laughs> but it says they're judging for a thousand years.
the interesting thing is at the end of the thousand years later in the chapter there is a great judgment and there's a resurrection and that's the second resurrection the second resurrection which is reserved only for the lost which is why I said in another seminar you know you want to make sure you do not partake of the second resurrection because it means you're lost you know born once die twice born twice die once that type of thing that I, that I mentioned <coughs> And um, so I can't remember where I was getting with all of this. Sitting in judgment for a thousand years. Oh, sitting in judgment for a thousand years. Uh, yeah, but I was getting someplace else, and I don't remember. The saints, we will be judging. Yes, the saints will be judging. What did you say again, Harold? You were talking about the goat being let out with all the... Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's where... I, okay, so that's where I'm headed. So on earth... The devil is bound for a thousand years. He's not destroyed during this thousand years, interestingly enough. He's not destroyed, but he is restricted, which is the great angel from heaven with a great chain grabbed the hold of the dragon and chained him up for a thousand years. And the Bible says, until the thousand years were over. So he's just temporarily chained for that millennium. And so connecting that with the scapegoat, Azazel, in, in uh, Leviticus 16, um, our interpretation in this seminar is that that is depicting how Satan is bearing the sins, symbolic in Leviticus 16, the goat. Well, now you have him literally doing that because there's nobody to tempt. There's nothing to do on planet Earth. It's decimated, it's destroyed, it's desolate, it's a horrible place. You don't want to be on planet Earth during a thousand years except for him. And everybody else is in heaven. And he's not destroyed at that point. And so he's out in the wilderness, just bearing the iniquities. He's the guilty one. But not in the sense of a sacrifice or a substitute. That's extremely important. Because people will have a problem with what I'm saying right now. You know, what? The only, how do you mean bear sins a goat? But it was never killed. It was never killed. And we know from Hebrews that forgiveness only comes by the, remission of sins only comes by the shedding of blood. Only. This is the interesting in Scripture, even from the Passover, the first Passover. The only way to be saved from destruction is by blood painted over your doors. That's the only way. There's no other way. There's no other way. So there's always this element of death and the shedding of blood in order to really have life, either in this planet, in this world, this time, or in the eternal sense, ever, everlasting life. It's the only way. It's through someone's sacrifice, be it an animal in the Old Testament, but ultimately Jesus Christ in the New. Any other questions regarding this morning? This okay. Oh, look, she wrote. Oh, she wrote something. Cool. <laughs> I, 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 no, I actually missed something. Okay. The nineteenth question. What does the holy? I didn't place, even bring it. What does the holy holy place need to be cleansed? Okay. So Leviticus. Why, why? I'm sorry. That's what was messing me up. Why does the holy place holy place need to be cleansed? I can only answer that with what the Bible says, but there are some things that the Bible doesn't go deep into. So, again, back to Leviticus 16. It needs to be cleansed. Let's go to that. Let's go to Leviticus 16. It says the holy place, which is a reference to, um, if I'm not mistaken, the whole tent of meeting, because everything was anointed. Um, let's go to Leviticus 16. And it says here, these are the instructions to Aaron. I'm looking at the verse. Okay. Okay. Look at, for, oh, by the way, Aaron even had to take a bath before doing all of this stuff. And he had to, you know, make a sacrifice for himself. Okay, so look at verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil. Do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle the bull was for himself, if I'm not mistaken, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Verse 16, he shall make atonement for the holy place 
because, there you go, there's a cause and effect, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins, and so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which re meeting the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So he did everything. Now the mercy seat is a reference to the most holy place. So you know it's the most holy place because that's on top of the mercy seat. But he says for everything. And here's the thing that I wanted to mention earlier. In that verse, verse 16, and then over in verse 21, it mentions three aspects of our rebellion, iniquities, transgressions, and sins. This is interesting because there's a connection there with, um, with Daniel. It mentions transgressions, iniquities, and sins. If you go over to Daniel chapter 9, I want to show you something. Those uh, three aspects. Where am I going? I'm going the wrong way. I'm here. Where's Daniel? <laughs> He's going the wrong way. Okay, look at verse 24. And chapter 9? Yes. Daniel 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophet. It says prophecy, but in Hebrew word can mean prophet. It's interesting because that, that's why we teach that there's a connection with this, um, the Day of Atonement, because it's mentioned in those three things, transgressions, sins, and iniquity. It's very interesting. What's the difference between those three? I okay. Sin, in, in Greek, sin is hamartia, and it literally means like if you're trying to shoot a bullseye and you miss the mark. That's what sin is. It's missing the mark. That describes everybody. Everybody. Every single human being. We all miss the mark. Even though we may sometimes try, our nature is we miss the mark. Transgression is, has the nature of and I think I said this uh, a few nights ago. When you, and I use this illustration, when you're traveling 55 miles an hour in a 35 mile per hour zone, you may be um, innocently ignorant of that 35 mile per hour uh, speed limit, but you're, you're traveling at 15 miles per hour faster than that, and you get caught by a cop. And if you're honest, you can say, I had no idea or I wasn't paying attention. Either way, if you had no idea or you weren't paying attention, you didn't do it deliberately. But you still broke the law, right? right. Oh, you didn't see it? That's okay then. You didn't break the law. No officer is going to tell you that. <laughs> okay? That's the idea of missing the mark. Even if you're ignorant, you missed the mark. You broke it. Re transgression has more of a serious nature to it. You knew of it and you decided to break it anyway. You know what I'm saying? Yep. You knew the speed limit was 35. I don't care, I'm in a rush, or I hate going so slow, whatever. And so you break it. That's a little bit different. That's a little bit different because now you can't claim ignorance. And so we are all guilty of both. But some may not be so guilty as a transgression of deliberately doing it. Um, and then iniquity, honestly, iniquity, uh, you'd have to get back with you on that one. But so those are, those are the differences of transgression and iniquity in, in, in general terms. Would it be oh, I'm sorry, she had her hand up. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, Diana. And then I had a second question. So when... This has got to be the last question because I just saw the time. <laughs> I thought people weren't allowed to be near or see the Ark of the Covenant. They weren't. But then when they were moving and carrying it, how were, was that kept away from all the people and so nobody could see it? How was that? Right. The Ark of the Covenant, with the exception of when it was placed in the most holy place, obviously it had to be uncovered. 
Um, but there were, obviously, I mean, God didn't take the, sh- I'm saying sheet. He didn't take the sheet off miraculously and it just disappeared. So when they had to pack up everything, they had to cover everything. There were three groups of Levites that were in charge of the sanctuary and only Levites, okay? The, the tribe of Benjamin had no place in the sanctuary. There was only Levites. There was the Kohathites and these other two groups I, I can't remember. So one group had the, was in charge of taking down all of the poles and all of the planks of wood and everything. Another group was in charge of taking down all of the coverings and the curtains and all of that stuff and folding them up. And other group was in charge of covering all of the furniture and moving the furniture. So somebody, they had to go, these particular groups of Levites, they had to go into the most holy place and cover it. Now, honestly, I don't know if, um, I mean, it was on pain of death that anybody would go into the most holy place. But when God says it's time to move, you have no choice. You have to, you know, take it apart. I don't know if they went backwards with a particular covering that was described by God to use, you know, and just did this (laughs) and covered it. And then they would turn around and then pick it up by the poles. Um, No, no, the high priest would go in there on the on the day of atonement but there's a group of levites and i mentioned one group there's of the three groups one group was in charge of moving the furniture so it wasn't the high priest it was some some levites okay let's go to our lesson um oh the the quiz so let's do the quiz first this is based on this morning the old testament sanctuary does everybody get a quiz card everybody have a quiz card The Old Testament sanctuary has no meaning for the Christian today. Okay, number two. The three parts of the Old Testament sanctuary represent three phases of the ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. And it's interesting. Well, okay. I don't want to talk anymore. (laughs) The sanctuary represents Christ's work of sacrifice intercession and final judgment sacrifice intercession and final judgment final judgment because that's a reference to the day of atonement number four according to daniel eight fourteen, okay unto 2300 days then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated according to daniel 8, 14 the pre-advent and i didn't really go over that term pre-advent today but all that means is there's a judgment Uh, that takes place before the second advent of Christ. That's what the word advent is, coming. So pre-second coming, that's what that means. According to Daniel 14, the pre... And if you're not sure this answer, don't don't put anything. Don't, you know, don't betray your own self-conscience. The use of the scapegoat in Leviticus 16 indicates that Satan helps save God's people from their sins. Okay? All right, number one. The OT sanctuary has no meaning for the Christian today. What would you say? False. Yeah, it's false because although the ceremonies and rituals are no longer valid, when Christ came, he invalidated all of that stuff. You don't have to have a sacrifice anymore. Like Badana, that co-worker I talked about the other night, <laughs> burning something. <laughs> oh boy. Um, but... It has meaning in the sense that it explains, uh, you know, there's a saying, the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, okay? Um, but we can extract a lot of meaning that could be meaningful for us today, just not in practice. Number two, the three parts of the Old Testament sanctuary represent three phases of the ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. What would you say to that? That's true. And in fact, the next question sort of answers that. The sanctuary represents Christ's work of sacrifice, intercession, and final judgment. What is that? Okay, that's true. Number four, according to Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then it will be reconsecrated. The pre-advent judgment began in 1844. What's the answer? Okay. And then the last one, the use of the scapegoat in Leviticus 16 indicates that Satan helped save God's people from their sins. Right? 
It's kind of like saying, hey, I saw a pink elephant flying just the other day up in the sky. <laughs> you say, you're crazy. A lot of people say that? Really? I haven't heard that. That Satan helps save us from our sins? Well, they say because of what we believe about God. Oh, okay, yeah, but... Yeah. So, ultimately, Satan saves us. Yeah, well, none of us are going to say that Satan saves us. N nobody. Nobody's going to say that. Okay. Okay. Um... Today's lesson, we are number 15, I think it is. Number 15, yes. Okay, so I didn't bring any out. I was sort of lost track of time and I came out here late. So, um, does anybody need lesson 15? He's got it. Good, we all? Okay. All right, so let's go to these verses. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them, but I am going to Romans. I love the book of Romans. You know, if you really think about it, Romans is a book about relationships. Mm -hmm. You really think about it. Um, the overall broad uh, element. Okay, Revelation, uh, Romans 12, verse 1, I be, um, page 1095. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice, okay? That is, uh, what do you call when two things are opposed? Forget the word. Double negative? Or no. no. Oxymoron. oxymoron. oxymoron yeah. That's the Lord of an oxymoron. No. Living sacrifice. <laughs> At least in Bible speak, living sacrifice. But that's what we are to do. Acceptable to God, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So, and any Jew reading this, the Roman Christians, some of them were Gentiles, others were Jews, when they saw that word sacrifice, they would understand right away. Well, it could be a bull, a goat, a sheep, you know, a ram. Clean animals. The, the clean animals. Um, and so we are to present our... And they were using the sacrificial system to present to God. And the animals could have no what? Blemish. blemish no defect. They had to be perfect. Well, that's what Paul is saying for us today. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And that is on page 1100, verses 16 and 17. Page 1100 in the Pew Bible. And it says, Do you not know that you are what? The temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. That's, uh, that's pretty clear, direct language. Don't destroy your body, yourself. I would say your life. Because if you do, um, you won't be saved. God will destroy you. What was that? I quit drinking over that verse. You kept what? I quit drinking over that verse. Oh. I thought she said, I kept drinking over that verse. Like, oh, I like this verse. <laughs> she says, I quit drinking over that verse. Okay, good. Good for that's powerful. That's a powerful testimony. And then uh, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, the context is about sexual immorality, and the verses say, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, and in your spirit, which are God's. And when the New Testament talks about spirit, it can talk about, it can mean breath, it can mean the Holy Spirit. It's all the same word, pneuma. It's where you get pneumatic tools, pneumonia. It's uh, something that has to do with air. Like pneumatic tools, <laughs> when they take a tire off. Um, the Greek word is pneuma, and um, again, depending on the context, it can refer to the Holy Spirit. That's why in English Bibles, if it's a capital S, it's the same word, pneuma, but scholars know this is referring to God's Spirit, so let's capitalize it. Um, it can refer to, like, attitudes and mindset, mindset, you know, your inner self. Um, it doesn't refer to a spirit in the sense of... Um, uh, 
a unique separate element of you that can continue to exist once you're dead. Now you continue to exist once you're dead in the memory of people, in the hearts of people. I feel like I'm carrying my dad right here next to me. Um, you know, people live on. But um, it doesn't refer to that, some disembodied thing. And then let's go to 1 Corinthians 10.31. Um, and that verse, I believe it says, whether you eat or whether you drink, somebody finish for me, do it, do it all to the glory of God. So the reason why we're sharing these verses is because these verses, along with a lot, you ought to read 1 Peter chapter 1. These verses, Colossians chapter 3 is another one. These verses are telling and encouraging us, hey, let's live for Jesus. Let's love him with all of our hearts and prove that love by the way we live our lives, the way we think. We are to be consecrated people. We're to be holy people to Christ. Um, we're not of this world. We're in it, but we are not of this world. And we are not to allow worldliness and temptation to overtake us. We're to master it. That's what these verses are, are saying. Offer ourselves as a living, holy sacrifice to God. Um, like it or not, we are different than the people of this world, people that don't know Christ. We're all in this world, but we are different. We are to act different, think different, respond different, dress different, eat different. Everything should be different about us. That's why the church is so dead nowadays, because we're too much like the people that don't know Christ. That's why we don't have any power. It's one of the reasons why. Okay, so let's go over the sequence of Daniel. Let's go into the lesson here. The sequence of Daniel. Uh, Daniel 7, 8, and 9. Uh, there's a concept of judgment in these chapters. Let me tell you something that I didn't, never said before. What does the name Daniel mean? Well, I yell uh, has to do with God. That's right. God is my judge. The E-L, El, Elohim. You know, the E-L in the word, it refers to God. Daniel means God is my judge. The book of Daniel opens and closes with judgment. In the middle, in Daniel 7, there's judgment. There's a judgment scene in, in the courts of heaven. So Daniel, even the name itself means God is my judge. The entire book of Daniel is very, very strongly and intimately connected with this concept of judgment. Now, think about the stories and the prophecies. Think about them. God is the one that causes nations to rise and fall. God is the one that judges, okay, Babylon, your time is up. God is the one that judges Nebuchadnezzar. You know what? You're going to go insane for seven years. God is the one that judges in favor of the saints, in favor of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in favor of Daniel. God is the one that is the judge throughout the whole book. He's the one that knows whether the king of the north and king of the south and all the four horns and all the activities. He's the one that's judging. He's the one that's arbitrating all of the movements of nations. And he is the final judge that will rise up in the last days and pronounce judge. Well, in Daniel 7, he pronounces judgment in favor of the saints. And at the end of the book, he will arise and rescue his people. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. God is judge. That is a very, very, I'm surprised I didn't say it earlier, because that's what I'm putting in the new lessons I'll be writing, which will be out in about seven years. <laughs> this is going to take a long time. Um, God is judge. God is judge, and it is seen throughout the entire book. Look at the picture on your front. That's talking about judgment right there. Okay, so let's go over the sequence of Daniel. The biblical symbol from Daniel 7 for each of the powers mentioned below. Let's do this. Who's the lion? Babylon. And who is the bear? Medo-Persia. And who is the leopard? Greece. Greece. And who is that ugly T-Rex? Pagan Rome. Okay, the dragon. Now we still have to go. How about the divided nations? Yeah, the ten horns. Divided Europe, the continent back there, back uh, then and now. And then what about the little horn? Now we, again in this uh, seminar, the 
historically, what fits the pictures of the little horn of Daniel 7, of Daniel 8, and the chronology of when this little horn rises to power, what the little horn does, and the duration of the little horn, that sequence of events. The Seventh Adventist Church, we teach that the papacy is the one that fits the bill, okay? And other people are going to disagree, I know, because the little horn is not the, the papacy or Roman Catholic power, it's Antiochus Epiphany, is the fourth. Um, what is the next scene? By the way, Antiochus, I said this and I'll say it again, Antiochus never brought the sanctuary low and brought it down, as Daniel says that the little horn does. He never brought it down. He went in and sacrificed the pig on the altar. The Jews were angered by that. And by the way, the Jews rose, they revolted, and ousted Antiochus. And then I think Harold mentioned the other day, it was uh, one of the Roman, uh, who was it? It was... Um, uh, and Antiochus went, I think he may have been in Africa or in Egypt. I can't, re I can't remember, well, same thing. I can't remember, but Antiochus is, is just gain a victory. And one of the Roman representatives confronts Antiochus. And remember, we talked about this? Literally drew a line in the sand with this way, or a stick or something. He says, you cross this line, the Roman guy said, and um, you will uh, bring the Roman armies down upon you. Uh, thereupon, Antiochus, you know, the tail went between his legs. <laughs> he just went away. He just turned around and he didn't dare, you know, provoke the Roman armies. Um, I just have a question. Sure. Yes. Yes. Um, they. That's coming, well, personally coming from the Catholic religion, you know, I mean, I, this is the first, well, I've heard it before. Right. I have heard it since I was a Catholic. I never heard about it. Yeah. I was a Catholic. I can't tell you, uh, you know, like if the Baptist church, uh, well, I can tell you, most of the uh, evangelical churches won't, but there are some pockets. There's this guy by the name of David Hunt. He's not Adventist by any means. In fact, Sometimes he comes down stronger than we do on the Catholic Church. He's, he's printed books, and he just, he's very, very strong. And um, I, I think there's, there's pockets. I've seen them on YouTube and you know, on, on videos that are not Adventist. Um, but as far as like entire denominations, I'm, I'm not aware, honestly. I'm not aware. I think, I don't know what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. I'm not sure. Anybody know? Right off the I mean, oh, Martin Luther did, yes. But all of that has changed since then. Um, what is the next scene that Daniel beholds after you have the division of the, the nations, then you have the little horn rising to power, then after the little horn rising to power, what does he see? This is the judgment. This is in Daniel 7. This is the, you know, what I was talking about. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Now, this takes place in heaven. Okay, it's taking place in heaven that Daniel is seen in vision. And this is that vision where the ancient of days sat, the judgment, those are the words just before this verse, the judgment was set and the books were opened. By the way, in the Bible, there's a lot of references to books. I should have brought it with me. I just have it on a sticky note stuck. One day I just spent hours and whoa, I just went through a Strong's Concordance. You can do the same thing. Go to Strong's Concordance. Look up the word book or books, and it'll take you some time to look it up yourself. And you'll see that God writes a lot of things in books, not just in Daniel. The judgment in the ancient of days, and then that's when it says, one like the Son of God came with multitude, thousands upon thousands and thousands and thousands of angels, and approached the ancient of days. Uh, and judgment was given in favor of the saints. That's, we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. Number three, Daniel repeats the sequence of empires a second time in chapter seven. Name the three powers he now mentions. Okay, here's the fourth beast. These are uh, what verses? They're verses nine and ten. Chapter seven, verses nine and ten. Okay, he sees the fourth beast, uh, representative of pagan Rome, 
Then he sees the ten horns, which are the divided nations. The barbarians invaded Rome, and, and uh, things just fell apart from there. Most commenters say that Rome fell because of uh, inner corruption. They just, they forgot their glory days and the Pax Romana during Jesus' day, and they just fell apart on the inside. And when that happens, you know, a house divided, what? Falls. Um, it was just inner corruption. And then, of course, he sees uh, the, the little horn. Number four asks, how long does the little horn power prevail against the saints? I hope you read this while you did already. Verses 21 and 22 in Daniel 7. <clears throat> it says here, until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. I'm going to open my Bible to Daniel 7. Okay. And then um, I'm going to read a little bit more. It says here, where am I? Okay, look at um, verse 21, Daniel 7, 21, page 865. This is Daniel saying, he says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. This is the little horn. Until, he says, until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. This is the New King James Version. The term in favor is a good translation of the Hebrew. Made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Keep that tucked in the back of your mind. That's an important verse. Okay? Now, yes. Judgment was against the little four. There's, so there's two... There's one judgment taking place in, in Daniel 7, but it does two things. Um, it does two things. One, it is condemning the activities of the little horn. That's what's taking place here in Daniel 7. The little horn has come to naught and because God is judging it so. The other thing that the same judgment does is it acquits the saints. And here's why. The little horn power is against God's saints. Is against God's saints. It persecutes God's people. It condemns God's people. It calls God's people uh, heretics and evil, um, thinking that they're doing God a service. This is what Jesus said in the New Testament. And so God's people, under the reign and power of the little horn, are mincemeat. They're sitting ducks, holy and good as they are. And so what God is doing is he is judging, he's reversing, so he's not only bringing judgment on the little horn, he's reversing the judgment. God is coming and saying, you are wrong. These are my people. These are my people. And so he's judging in favor of his people that have been condemned and ousted and ostracized and murdered by the power of the little horn. Now, is that the investigating judgment? Yes, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. That's what this lesson is. Okay, number five. In the third giving of this sequence in Daniel 7, Daniel again mentions the fourth beast, pagan Rome, the ten horns, the ten divisions of the Roman Empire, and the little horn, papal Rome. What event does Daniel foretell? The judgment. So if you look at the latter part of Daniel chapter 7, look at verse uh, 25. Daniel 7 verse 25. He shall speak, this is a reference to the little horn, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. This is the angel talking to Daniel, giving the interpretation. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. That's, that is 1,260 days based on uh, the biblical month um, or three and a half years. Verse 26, but the court 
shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So here, what uh, the angel is telling Daniel is, yeah, buddy, you're coming to your, your end, and the kingdom shall be given to the saints. Judgment is going to be in favor. This is the third time this is mentioned in this chapter about judgment, about judgment, about judgment. So it's a very, very strong, powerful element in um, the whole book of Daniel, but particularly here in chapter 7. How long does the little horn power reign? Well, I just answer that by reading it. A time and times and the dividing of time. Okay, time, times. What question was that? I'm lost here. Here it is, number six. Now look at the note uh, below question number six. The time times and the dividing of time equals 1,260 days or prophetic years. So that's 1,260 years. The 1,260 years began with the destruction of the last of the three powers that prevented the papacy from having full supremacy, which was the Ostrogoths. It's one of those uh, weird names of those tribes back then. There was a lot of Germanic tribes coming to destroy Rome and, uh, and all these other tribes. The decree of Justinian, which gave the Pope power in the West, was finally put into effect in 538. In 1798, 1260 years later, French General Berthier, under orders from Napoleon, took the Pope prisoner, ending the temporal sovereignty of the Pope and fulfilling to the very year the 1260-year prophecy. Daniel 7 predicted that this little horn power would control and dominate the saints for this 1260-year period. There wasn't persecution during that whole time. But there was this predominance. When this period was over, God would convene the judgment. That's why Daniel sees the judgment scene coming right after the reign of the little horn power. Underline that sentence. The judgment is after the little horn has already arisen and is exercising power. This is when the judgment would, would take place. From Daniel 7, we can learn that the judgment occurs sometime after 1798, or after 1798. Daniel 8 gives us the final details which pinpoint exactly when this judgment begins. I always like to show this in, in, uh, in, in this seminar. Um, you can get this easily on the internet now, I'm sure. I haven't, I haven't looked since, but this is a newspaper. I wish it was the original. I wouldn't have it like this if it was. <laughs> It'd be encased in glass or something. But this is a newspaper, it's called The Times, Monday, March 12, 1798. You want to see what newspapers looked like back then? This is what they looked like. You know, no big headlines or graphs or pictures except for this. I'm sure it's a wood cutout and it's printed on there. In 1798, obviously, they used to make books and the printing presses invented, you know, 200 years earlier. The movable type printing press in Europe. Um, this is March 12, 17, I didn't say 1978, I said 1798. This is 1798. And it's interesting because um, here it gives, it gives verbatim what General Berthier said on uh, entering Rome. <laughs> it's just really interesting. And it says here, General Berthier published the following proclamation on entering Rome. The Roman people are restored to their rights of sovereignty by broke proclaiming their independence by assuming the government of ancient Rome and by constituting the Roman Republic. The general-in-chief of the French army in Italy declares, in the name of the French Republic, because this is Napoleon's general, in the name of the French Republic, that he acknowledges the independent Roman Republic. This is cool. And that it is under the special protection of the French arms. The general in chief also acknowledges in the name of blah, 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 blah. And down on the bottom it says the French general, somebody, is charged with the erection of the police and providing for the security of the city of Rome and also with the installation of the new government. The Roman Republic, acknowledged by the French Republic, comprehends all the territory which remained under the temporal authority of the Pope after the Treaty of Campo Fornio. 
And it says here, when the people at Rome came out to meet General Berthier, they presented him with a crown of olives, but in accepting it, he says, oh, that it belongs to Napoleon. <laughs> wow. uh, but it's, um, and then I have some more statements here that it was just a day of jubilee. Isn't that when he took the Pope? Yeah. So Pope Pius VI, in this case, was taken prisoner. In fact, Pope Pius and some of his cardinals, not a lot of them, were celebrating Mass. When all of a sudden this was taking place outside and he started shaking and was scared and literally, uh, literally, they, oh no, what's, and that was the end of the reign of the papal power temporarily yes. in, in 1798. Harold? So this, this, something happened in heaven that, I mean, we know that God orchestrates all that. Right. But did a time frame happen in heaven and then this was, or this was just, like, uh, We're going to go over that. Or, or this was Nebuchadnezzar, like Nebuchadnezzar. Berthier was actually acting in the behalf of God and was orchestrating all this. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, God, if I understand what you're saying, God always uses human beings to do his will. Whether that human being acknowledges God as God or not, you know, God, God can, you know, he, he, he does those things. And it's always through human powers. Always, always. Um, okay, let's go to this one. Uh, the sequence of Daniel 8 now. Give the interpretation for each of the symbols listed below in Daniel 8. So now we're in Daniel 8. Okay. The ram is Medo-Persia, right? And the fierce goat, who does it represent? Greece. That goat, yep, it represents Greece. Okay. And then the notable horn on the he goat is Alexander himself. it is Alexander himself, Alexander the Great. Okay. And then letter D, the four horns that came up are what? The four divisions of Greece. Um, it was divided. There was a little bit of, you know, contention there for a little bit between this guy and that guy. And then finally it ended up being... Um, uh, divided into the four uh, generals. In one of the um, lessons that we did, it said that one horn was larger than the other. Yes, so that was, that was him. The notable horn, see that? The notable horn on the goat was Alexander the Great. Yeah, so there was, there was only one horn on the goat when it attacks the ram. Yes. It said one horn, you know, oh, the, one that's, horn. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, the the little horn after these four horns, well, let's see what it says here. There it is. So after, after these four horns that came up, then a little one came up. That's probably what you're referring to. Okay. Yeah. And then it has sort of uh, two phases because um, after Greece came Rome, but then the sort of activities that it was engaged in, then it became uh, religious Rome. Mm -hmm. Religious Rome. Just the, the different activities. Number eight, according to Daniel 8, what is the next thing that happens after the reign of the little horn? According to Daniel 8, verses 13 and 14. We looked at it this morning. Yes. Or the, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Okay. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, listen to this. The cleansing of the Old Testament sanctuary during the Day of Atonement that we talked about this morning. Okay? That was a judgment day. Because God was judging His people and the sanctuary clean. It's all about judgment. When the uh, high priest went in there and sprinkled blood on the mercy seat, etc., uh, and then cleanse the people and those two goats. This was a day of judgment. It was a day of judgment. That's how God is uh, portraying himself. And so he declared his people clean, and he declared the sanctuary clean. Now, all of this, of course, is done through rituals and, and ceremonies. But God is in that role as, as judge. Um, when you go home and you want to wash your car, before you wash your car, what kind of decision do you have to make? Is it clean? <laughs> is it clean or is it dirty? There's, there's always a decision. When you take a shower and, oh man, I need a shower. What do you do? 
Ooh, oh boy. <laughs> oh man, I need a shower. You're making a judgment call, right? That's what's going on with the sanctuary. This is, it is a day of judgment. Okay, notice in this chart how these chapters parallel each other. And it's, it's in your lesson. Oh, I wanted to read this note. The note below question number eight. The cleansing of the sanctuary is the parallel to the judgment in Daniel 7, which is the judgment scene. Uh, I mixed it up. Is the event that follows the reign of the little horn. In Daniel 8, the event pictured is the cleansing of the sanctuary, which follows the little horn. From our study of the ancient Jewish sanctuary, we have learned that the cleansing of the sanctuary referred to the work of what? Judgment. Whereas Daniel 7 gave us the approximate time for the beginning of the judgment, sometime after that date. Daniel 8 gives us the exact details. It starts at the end of 2300 days in 1844. Okay, so, and then you can see, of course, and you have the same thing. Look at Daniel 7 and 8. You have the 10 horns, 10 divisions of Rome. Daniel 8 doesn't mention it. The little horn, little horn wax great. Judgment, cleansing of the sanctuary. Daniel 7, 8, and 9 um, are, you can't separate one from the other. You have to keep those chapters together. If you take one out, then you're just shooting in the dark. They, they all go together. Okay, the good news of the judgment. So, in our church, your church, Seventh Adventist Church, um, our understanding of truth progresses, does it not? At least it should. <laughs> the truth doesn't progress. The truth has always been there. Our understanding of it can increase, can get better. Present truth. Present truth, yeah. So, um, tr truth is always there. In some eras, there may be some of that truth is a little obscured. And that could be for different reasons. Just because of the times, the way the times are, the influences around us, um, you know. So, different aspects can be brought out. People study the scriptures. You get scholars and schools being established, and with the passage of time and tools and biblical tools, understanding is increased. Understanding is increased. That's just that's just the nature of things. Um, so I'm saying this is because uh, once in a great while, whenever we touch on this topic, and, and I haven't heard this recently, but um, I wasn't there. But my understanding is. Back in the you know 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, this idea of uh, judgment before the second coming of Christ struck fear in a lot of people. It's just and the and the the fear was, am I living perfect? If I am I living right? Because I want to pass the judgment in heaven. When Christ comes back, they're, they're, when is my name going to come up in the books of heaven? And I will be judged. And that caused a lot of apprehension and fear and misery. <laughs> I would say, and misery. If we're going to constantly live in the shadow of a judging God, you better be perfect or else you're not going to make it. You know, who can live in that type of shadow? You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And so what's interesting is the Hebrew word, it's actually just one word, because there's no vowels in Hebrew. There's no vowels in Hebrew. There's only consonants. And the Hebrew word back in chapter 7, Daniel 7, uh, judgment was given to the saints. My Bible said in favor of the saints. That Hebrew word to the saints or for the saints, the best meaning of it uh, behind that word is in favor of the saints. And we need to remember this, that the cleansing of the sanctuary in the Old Testament, think about it this way, think about it this way. In the Old Testament times, when the older sanctuary was still set up, when the Day of Atonement came, the Day of Atonement comes, we know that nobody's to work on that day. The high priest is going to go, um, you hear the horns and the the shofar and in the things that are taking place is a very solemn day, very solemn day. Would you think that the people back then would think to themselves, 
man, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. Would you think they were thinking that? Or are they saying, I want to be lost. I don't care about this. I want to be saved. Do you think God wants to save us? Yeah. God wants to save us. But God doesn't save us using the Old Testament sanctuary as an illustration. God doesn't say, ooh, I can hear all of those prayers. Those people really want to be saved. You know what? Aaron, let's just cancel everything. Cancel it out. I'm just going to save them. No. Because God saves through confession and repentance. God is not going to save us in our condition of sinfulness if we don't admit it. God wants to save, but he says, but if you really want to be saved, you have to come to realization that you need to be saved. And when you come to the realization that you need to be saved, you're going to recognize your own darkness. You're going to recognize your darkness. You got some sins in you. I want to save you, but we have to recognize the darkness in you. So I want you to recognize that and acknowledge that. I want you to confess your sins. Think about, think about what's going on in your life. Think about your relationship with me. I want to save you, but this is the way it has to work. Otherwise, there's no salvation. So God wants to save us. He really does. But it comes through acknowledgement of our true state of being and confession and trust. Because after all, in the Day of Atonement, Aaron goes and kills an animal and sprinkles blood on a piece of wood that's overlaid with gold. And all of a sudden, that cleanses the building and that cleanses me. Are you kidding? I bet the next day, the day after the Day of Atonement, I bet you anybody somebody sinned. I'll bet you a thousand bucks. I'll bet you my paycheck. <laughs> there are some people in the camp <laughs> that sinned on the day after the atonement. Maybe not deliberately and sacrilegiously. Okay, now it's over. Now we can do whatever we want. No, I'm not saying that. And so if the day of atonement, we, the sanctuary was cleansed and we are cleansed of our sins just by the sprinkling of the blood, then how come I sin the next day? I don't get it. I don't understand this. And then six months later, somebody does something wrong and commits a lie and admits it to mom and dad. You know, I don't get it. What is the Day of Atonement and all the, those rituals? Are they powerless to change me? So it's, it's symbolic of what God does for us. But we have to continually live trusting that what God said he would do, he would do. If I sinned a week after the Day of Atonement, it doesn't mean the Day of Atonement was false and God didn't really, I didn't really truly confess my sins and God didn't really forgive me of my sins. Is that what that means? No. So the Day of Atonement, there wasn't something magical about it in those days that made the people perfect. Otherwise, we wouldn't read about those stories of rebellion until finally, 2 Chronicles chapter 36 says, God sent the Babylonians because there was no remedy left. That's what it says. I'm quoting verbatim. And so this idea of God is judging me. No, God wants to save us. But there are terms to every relationship. There's terms to every relationship. You, you two are celebrating your 50th anniversary. But I'll bet you these last 50 years or plus when you met, you've always had terms of relationship. It wasn't an open relationship. <laughs> it wasn't an open relationship. It wasn't that, um, you know, that a, a married couple can behave themselves and act like singles. There's terms to relationship. The same thing with us and God. So we can trust that when we ask God forgiveness, he will forgive us. And he's on our side. He wants to save us. There's just terms on how that works. Anyways, uh, too much. I talk too much. Number 10. Number 10. What is declared? This is the good news of the judgment. What is declared in heaven when God's judgments are made manifest? Revelation 19 verses 1 through 3. Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. I mean, all heaven rejoices at judgment because evil is destroyed 
and good triumphs. And good triumphs. That's the idea, right? Number 11, what does the first angel's message proclaim about the judgment? Okay, so now we're in the book of Revelation. And you have this picture in the last days of these three angels doing something. So the first angel's message says the hour of his judgment is come. The hour of his judgment is come. The note says, notice the present tense of this verse. When this special message is proclaimed, when it is proclaimed from John's day in Revelation, that was future still. When it's proclaimed, the judgment is not future, it is not past, it is actually in progress. This message of the judgment in session could only refer to 1844. And uh, got to rush this because I want to I want to talk about pull these things together. What three injunctions are given as a result of the judgment being in session? There's three injunctions. Number one, fear God. Let her be give glory to God. And the last one is worship Him because He's the Creator. So there's fearing God, meaning a, a healthy reverence, a healthy veneration, not a morbid afraidness of God, and then giving glory to Him and worshiping Him. Now there's two aspects of the judgment. One, the first aspect, why does Daniel say the sanctuary has to be cleansed? And we went over this earlier today, because the sanctuary and the host are trodden underfoot. Now, this is in Daniel chapter, it was Daniel chapter 7, because the sanctuary and the host are trodden underfoot. Daniel indicates that the reason why the sanctuary needs to be cleansed is the sin. And now here in the lesson it says sin of the little horn. There is a judgment on the little horn, but there also, it's related to God's saints because of what the Bible says. Favor, a judgment will be given in favor of the saints. Number 14, what did the little horn do to God's sanctuary? What did he do? Antiochus didn't do this. Okay, He magnified himself even to the prince of the host, Christ. I'm, I'm just as good as Christ or even better. That's the idea behind this. Okay, Letter B, the daily sacrifice was taken away. Remember, what did I say about this word last night? Yes, that yes, they do. and this word is actually supplied in the Bibles, supplied? so the supplied, it's inserted. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the word sacrifice is not in there, so it's not just sacrifices. That, that's important to some uh, different interpretations, but just, so it's the daily. The daily was taken away, which includes all of the services in the holy place, not the most holy place. But the daily services were in the holy place. The most holy place was a yearly service, not a daily service. Okay, so the daily refers to trimming the wicks, every week putting fresh bread on the table of bread, making sure there's fresh uh, incense, continually burning. That's a, so you can see how the Levites continually had to dress up the place. Continually, continually, continually. The sacrifice was twice a day. Let us see. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. This is what the little horn power did. And then, letter D, the little horn power cast truth to the ground. So these are the four great sins that Daniel charges to the little horn in Daniel chapter 8. Okay? Magnum sized himself to the prince of the host, uh, a claim being equal with God. Uh, the second uh, on your note says taking away the daily in the Old Testament sanctuary service, the daily referred to the work of the courtyard and the holy place, Christ's work of sacrifice and intercession. That's what the holy place was all about, right? It's, it's, it symbolizes the daily intercession of Jesus for us. Prayers, the Holy Spirit, the light of the Holy Spirit, Christ giving his Holy Spirit to us, not leaving us as orphans, um, bread, Remember Christ said that I am the bread that came down from heaven. Your fathers ate the manna and they're dead. But if you eat me, this bread, you will live forever. So Christ is our daily bread. His word is our daily bread. Amen. Amen. 
and the reason why I say that is because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So Christ is the Word made flesh. You can't separate our Bible from Jesus. It's one and the same. So when I say our daily bread, you're feeding on Christ and his word. In fact, remember what Jesus says? If you have my word abiding in you, abide in my truth, abide in my word. In fact, he says, the man or the woman who builds their house on a rock and the storms came is the person who not only listens to my words, but what? Does them, eats them, practices them. That's the house built on a rock, is what Jesus said in that parable. Anyways, um, and then the second aspect of the judgment is that in the Old Testament sanctuary service, this is question 15, what necessitated the cleansing of the sanctuary? We went over that this morning. The uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. That's why it needed to be cleansed. Leviticus 16 says that, clear as day. Clear as day. So the second thing that necessitated the cleansing was our sins. Since there are two things that defile the sanctuary, the judgment beginning in 1844 must be a twofold judgment. One, it must bring judgment for the saints. Two, it must bring judgment for the little horn. And that's what I said earlier. That same judgment does two things. Condemns the little horn activities and it acquits and defends the saints of God. Vindicates, that's the word I'm looking for. Vindicates them. Uh, question number 16. Oh, what does this say? Since there are two things that defile the sanctuary, the judgment beginning in 1844 must be a twofold judgment. It brings judgment for or in favor of the saints, and it brings judgment for the little horn. Okay? In other words, there's a positive and a negative aspect to it. Negatively, it will decide against the little horn. Positively, it will decide in favor of the saints, this, this judgment. Okay, what message is preached as part of the everlasting gospel? We saw this earlier. The hour of his judgment is come. The hour of his judgment is come. And then it says here, question number 17, who else is judged in the pre-advent judgment? According to Daniel 7.22, we read this. Judgment was given to, or in favor of, the saints of the Most High. It was given in favor of the saints of the Most High. So, um, I wish I had the lesson out here for, um, for Tuesday night. But this is how it works. So this is what I said earlier, to bring all of these things together. Daniel 7 and 8 are talking about judgment. This judgment, if, I, if this was a, a, a line, a timeline... And this is way over here. In this timeline, you have all of those four nations, Rome, Greece, etc. You have those four nations. Then you have the dividing of nations. So there's no more reigning world power in the sense of a political power. There's no more. Everything's divided. But then after that division, uh, after those, uh, that mixture, that division, you have this little horn power rising to power. And the saints are given over to this power for a time, times, and half a time. In prophetic language, that's 1,260 years. So now we're moving way over here. Seems too long. That little horn, am I going off camera? <laughs> going off camera. Hello. <laughs> so that's it. That's a long time. So 1,260 years. Okay. And then judgment will be made against the little horn and in favor of the saints. But during that 1,260 years, this little horn power blasphemes God, brings the place of his sanctuary low, takes, gets rid of the daily, the intercessory ministry of Christ, does away with that, um, blasphemes, pompous words against the Most High, and persecutes the saints of the Most High for that long period of time. That's a long time. This is the sequence of these chapters. And then at the very end, you have the judgment. But in Daniel chapter 8 and 9, when will the sanctuary be cleansed? When will this cleansing be done? Well, the, the chapters give the answer. From the, from the decree to build and restore Jerusalem 
until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then after that, the last week, he will, he will uh, um, for the last week, he will cause the sacrifices to end, but he will be cut off in the middle of that last week. That's Christ's crucifixion. So we're over there. Now I'm going to transfer it over here so I can stay in camera. So here's Christ's crucifixion. Three and a half years later, Stephen is stoned. Okay, that fulfills that 490 years, which is the same beginning point of the 2,300 years until the sanctuary is cleansed. So now we have, from after the 490 years, we have, now I'm going to come over here, now we have 1,810 years left for that 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. So now we come to 1844. And now we have the sanctuary being cleansed. So this is what the lesson is bringing across. I'll have this really nice and clear with those new lessons, <laughs> which will be done in seven years. <laughs> so I won't be here. Um, 1844 in the Seventh Avenue Church is a very, very important date, obviously. But it doesn't mean when the sanctuary is cleansed, um, it doesn't mean that it is a time period where God goes through the books, where the books are open. God goes through the books and he's looking for Bob. Bob, oh dear. <laughs> we got to make sure he cleans up his act. And then we come to somebody named Diana. Oh dear, got to make sure. And then we come to somebody named Ray Navarro. Oh dear. Um, they better clean up their act before Jesus comes back. It's not the way it works. The way it works, my view of this, is that it is the anti, well not my view, it's the anti-typical Day of Atonement. In the literal Day of Atonement, people had to confess their sins, make sure they were right with God, um, and you know, that type of deal, self-examination. We should be doing the same thing. Our problem is that we translate that into good works will save us. I'm, so, I'm examining myself, I'm not good, I gotta get right, I gotta start doing things. And some people may go too far and begin to believe that if I do good, I'll be saved because that'll win me merit points before God because of those books that are open and a judgment taking place in favor of the saints. That's not the way it works. Um, the way I see it is this, what, what uh, calamity happened in Revelation chapter 12? Something huge happened in Revelation 12. Something up in heaven, something terrible happened in heaven. According to Revelation 12. Yeah. War. War happened in heaven. Why did war happen in heaven of all places? There was rebellion, there was, there was Lucifer, there was mutiny. And uh, do you think God likes that? To take place in heaven of all places? No. Um, does God really need to open the books to see who's going to be saved or to, you know, to cleanse? Or, does God really need a book? I mean, let me ask you that question. God doesn't need a book. Uh, he is a book. <laughs> He's got, he's omniscient, which means he has perfect knowledge. He doesn't need a book. And then when it says in Daniel 7, the court was seated and the books were open. Well, who do you think is presiding over this court? Probably Christ, because it says the Son of God came to him with a multitude of angels, thousands upon thousands, came to the Ancient of Days. The books, the, the court sat and the books were open. I really, really do not think that Jesus Christ or the Heavenly Father needs books to figure out, you know, <laughs> anything of what's going here on earth or in our hearts. He doesn't need that. Yeah, the claim by Satan was that God was not fair. That's right. The claim. And so it's for the universe. Of course. Of course. They have the record. God is not fair, and God is withholding further blessings from us. 
That was an intended accusation of Lucifer towards Eve in the garden. Did God say you'd die? Oh, you won't die. In fact, if you take this fruit, you will become like God's. So the insinuation is that God is deliberately withholding a higher experience, experience from you. He is withholding blessings, is withholding good from you. That's what he is, he's insinuating to Eve. And the same thing has gone over there. The grease is always greener on the other side. And the church, it's, ugh, it's like eating cardboard. You know, out in the world, that's where the real fun is and the real good experiences are. It's, the lie continues and it convinces us. It strongly convinces us. So that was the accusations in heaven, I'm sure. The ones that need the knowledge that's written in the books is not God in Christ or the Holy Spirit. Who needs that knowledge in heaven? The bad angels. I would say the angels. Do you think the Trinity and the angels want to risk war happening again in heaven? Are you kidding me? Heaven is doing all it can to prevent this from happening again. And the angels that we're talking about, those ones that are up there, that 66% up there, they were involved in the war. They personally fought that battle. They remember as it happened five minutes ago. They remember how horrible it was to fight against their fellow colleague angels, sword to sword or however they did it. They remember it. They don't want that to happen again. And they don't want mutiny to happen again in heaven with earthlings who are sinful and going up to heaven. Are you kidding, God? How can we be sure that these people are, are good to go? That's where the books come in. It's not that God is trying to keep us out and we have to amass good works to make it to heaven. If you have a relationship with Jesus, a faith relationship with Jesus, faith is what you need. That's why it was credited to Abraham before the law. Abraham was credited righteousness before the law, based on a promise, based on his belief in God. Now that belief translates into the obedience, yes. But if we have that kind of faith relationship with Christ, we're good to go. As long as we stick to the terms of the relationship. Humility, he has showed you, O oh man, what is good, what the Lord requires of you. But to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Micah 6, 8. As long as we keep those terms of the relationship, as for filling of the Holy Spirit, we're good to go. And when we make it in heaven, and those books are open, I would think, now the Bible doesn't say this, but there are multitudes of angels coming with Christ. And I don't think there's just 12 books. And if there are, they're probably two miles high. I don't know. I don't know what those books look like. But God does not need to go over the authenticity of our faith expression in Him. He knows already. Jesus knows. The Holy Spirit knows. Who needs to know this? It's got to be the heavenly beings, the angels. It's for their sake. So they know, God, you're right. This person, you're right. This person is the real deal. This person is genuine. It doesn't mean perfectionism. It means being perfect in the sense of whole in Jesus Christ. An ongoing relationship. Let me close by saying this just too. In the Old Testament, being righteous with God is tantamount to having a relationship with God. That's not just a modern grace-based statement. This is fact. Righteousness with God is a relationship with God. But you better define that relationship in proper terms. We have to, we have to define that relationship to understand how that relationship works. But it's a relationship. Number 18... What did it say? With whom does Peter say, judgment must begin with the house of God? Um, who is to be in my, who's to be my lawyer in the judgment? I always like this. First John 2, 1, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And so he's our residing judge, God the Father, deciding judge Jesus, pleading attorney Jesus. It's fixed. 
it's fixed. Okay, so let's end this. Here's the response. All those verses. <laughs> okay, we got to end this. Do you wish to engage Jesus as your lawyer in the judgment that is now going on in heaven? Of course. Of course, I think we all do. Okay, the next lesson is uh, the judgment continues. Then we're going to go after this lesson, which is Tuesday night, then we're going to go, go into Daniel's 10, 11, and 12. Okay? Hang on to your seats. Those are doozy. Those are hard ones. Okay, so why is, let's all stand up. Let's stretch because the speaker spoke too long. And why don't you greet each other? We didn't do that at the beginning. So go ahead and say hello to each other and ask each other how your day went. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're passing out the lessons now. Bob is passing out the lessons for Tuesday night. So this is going to be lesson one. This is lesson f uh, 15, 16. He's passing out lesson 16. Oh. We... We won the same one. Oh, okay. Twice. All right. Let's see. I have a prize to give away today. Because uh, Dora and uh, Carlos already won this one, so he's returning this. All right. And it's used up. It's all scratched here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's still in its plastic wrapping. Okay, so um, let's see. How can I make this fair? Uh, I'm going to, okay, I'm, I don't know why I'm just thinking about this. Okay, uh, well, some of you are going to, no, that's not fair. That's, <laughs> the question I just was thinking is not fair. Um, let's see. <clears throat> well, let me ask this first. I need a show of hands. This video, it's called The Daniel Chronicles, Unlocking Prophetic Timelines. Some of you may have this already. Um, and it's sort of a documentary. Uh, it's very good. I've seen this one. With I just have mine with a, it's a different uh, cover. But that's what this is. Who is interested in this DVD? Just raise your hand. Don't be shy. One, two, three. Three people. Okay, then good. Then I'll ask you to pick a number between 1 and 20 then. <laughs> so that makes it easy. So pick a number between 1 and 20. The closest one gets the DVD. Uh, let me tell Les my number.